Well, good afternoon and welcome to the University of Washington Botanic Gardens um, and NHS Hall, where we're going to make the, this afternoon's presentations. Uh, my name's Tom Hinckley, and I'm the interim director for the School of Forest Resources. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware, but the United Nations declared 2011 uh, as the International Year of Forests. And very early in the year, uh, the school, namely Mac Hoagland, who's an affiliate member, uh, decided we ought to take advantage of this theme and work out a series of events that we would hold throughout the year. So this Denman lecture uh, is one, just one part of a theme, and I'll, I'll talk more about the context for the theme. But we're today going to have sort of vignettes into a whole set of uh, projects that we have that involve some aspect uh, of international presence or, or a history of international connections. Um, and so let's, let's begin. Uh, there's a long-term tradition within the former College of Forest Resources and now School of Forest Resources uh, in hosting international students. Uh, but around 1960, at least for the date that I could find, uh, was, the, was, the, was sort of our beginning, sort of big entrance into an international arena when the University of Washington, through the College of Forest Re Forestry at the time, hosted the Fifth World Forestry Congress on campus. And the, there's an a international grove of trees over by Condon Hall um, along the boulevard there that it was, they were planted as a result of that particular Congress. Uh, members of, of then the college were instrumental in establishing the Organization for Tropical Studies, uh, which now continues as, as uh, hosted at Duke University, but it was originally uh, hosted by the University of Washington, Dean Bethel. And, uh, Bill Hathaway were instrumental in that. Um, in 1984, um, then Dean Thorard worked with the state legislature to initiate the Center for International Trade and Forest Products. Uh, we, thanks to Ivan Easton, which you will hear about later, we host the Peace Corps Master's International Program. And more recently, we've hosted through the National Science Foundation a series of integrated graduate education and research training endeavors, uh, urban ecology with uh, host countries of Germany and Norway, and the uh, uh, multinational collaborations on challenges to the environment, which hosted many nations around the world. So we'll learn more about those, uh, those today. Back to the International Year of, of Forest, sort of the first event was uh, sustaining our Northwest World Lecture Series by Nalini, Nalini Nadkarni, and then just Friday of last week, uh, three uh, distinguished alums came and provided really insights to both their careers and their engagement in, in the international setting. And this, the Denman series today is a continuation of this theme. And then in the fall, there will be an exchange with the University of British Columbia. Um, and that will probably be the last sponsored event. We have a lot of examples. Uh, Nalini Narkani's head poking out through a tropical canopy is one, but we, we have some, many more recent endeavors where either individual faculty and staff or groups of students are going internationally and spending anywhere from a week to, uh, to a year and engaging in, in research, teaching, or other sort of engagement with uh, in an international setting, and we want to talk about those those particular examples today. Uh, we're very thankful to uh, Bob Edmonds uh, faculty and Ellen Matheny uh, staff for organizing this particular session. And as Bob has already outlined, there's going to be three parts to the sessions, a series of talks, uh, then followed by uh, transition. And then at the very end, we'll come back for questions. Uh, once again, welcome. And thank you for attending this afternoon's uh, meeting. Bob? Okay, so welcome to session two, which is sustainable forest management. And our first speaker in this session is Ivan Easton, who is a professor of forest Pro products marketing and the director for the International uh, Center for International Trade and Forest Products, or CINTRAFOR, and a faculty leader of the Peace Corps Masters International in Forestry program in the School of Forest Resources. 
and he has a BS and MS from Michigan Technological University and an MS and a PhD from the University of Washington. And his research interests involve international forest products marketing, particularly in Asia. And he has considerable experience in West Africa, especially with the Peace Corps. And he's going to tell us about his Peace Corps experience and the program. And the title is the Peace Corps Master's International Program Supporting Sustainable Resource Management in Developing Countries. Ivan. Okay, thanks, Bob. I'd like to also thank the Denman family for supporting this lecture series. So as a former Peace Corps volunteer, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to, to continue working with Peace Corps. Um, I had a great experience as a Peace Corps volunteer, and I really enjoy working with the young students as they come through, um, as they go through their classes, and as they go off into their assignments, and then as they come back into the, the program. So what I'm going to try and do is kind of give you an overview of the PCMI program, describe what it is, uh, describe the relationship that the University of Washington has with Peace Corps, um, then take you out and visit a few sites. Let you see what some of the, the forestry volunteers from the University of Washington are doing uh, around the world. And then have a few closing observations and talk about some of the challenges for the Peace Corps uh, Master's International Program, as well as the outlook. So we've got a long um, and really storied history here at the University of Washington with Peace Corps. Um, historically, we're the number three provider of volunteers into the Peace Corps, volu uh, into the Peace Corps program. And in, in the year 2010, we were also rated number three in terms of providing undergraduate students uh, into the Peace Corps program. And we were rated number one in terms of providing uh, graduate students into the PCMI program. So that tradition continues, and we hope to, to keep that going for a long time. A little background. Uh, Peace Corps itself was started in 1961. That means this year, as you can see by my little pin here, uh, Peace Corps is celebrating its 50th year. Uh, Peace Corps Master's International Program was started in 1987, and so next year we'll be celebrating our 25th year. Um, and the Peace Corps Master's, Pro Master's International Program is really a, a program that allows graduate students to integrate their graduate studies with the Peace Corps experience. And so they can get not only their studies uh, accomplished, but also get that international research experience under their belt, so that when they get out, they have the, the, all of the, the, the the, the bona fides to go out and get a job with a, a development organization. Uh, the Peace Corps Master's Program started in 87, like I mentioned. Uh, but really, in the last couple of years, Peace Corps has really seen the value in the PCMI program. And starting in 2009, they decided to really expand that program. And you can see both in terms of the number of colleges and universities participating in the program, as well as the number of programs themselves, both jumped by about 40%. Uh, from 2009 to 2010. And so what are the benefits of the PCMI program? Well, there, there's benefits to Peace Corps, and there's also benefits to the graduate students. For Peace Corps, they get a more mature, experienced uh, volunteer with specialized training. Um, also, the Peace Corps volunteers, when they come back, they act as mentors to the new volunteers who are getting ready to go out and can kind of better prepare them. And when they get to site, they're more prepared for, for what they're supposed to be doing um, in country. For the graduate students, there's a number of benefits. Uh, a couple of them are, first of all, they can complete their program a lot faster. Uh, and by doing the integrated PCMI uh, graduate program, you can generally complete that program in between 50 and 54 months. If you were to do it sequentially, either do Peace Corps followed by graduate students, graduate studies, or vice versa, uh, it'll take you anywhere from 71 to 78 months. Um, and that means you're going to have lower tuition costs. Uh, a Peace Corps Master's student is generally in residence paying tuition only four quarters, whereas your, your typical master's student will generally be here for six quarters. Um, and then if you're a Peace Corps master's international student, you usually get five or more uh, credits for free while you're uh, serving in Peace Corps, assuming that you com uh, successfully complete your Peace Corps service. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about Peace Corps in the School of Forest Resources. Our program started in 2005. Uh, we started uh, relatively slowly trying to build that program up. Uh, since we started the program, we've had two students graduate out of the program. We've got five students who are in the field right now. We have two students who are waiting to leave. One's, one's got their assignment, and the other one is waiting for their assignment. And we've admitted, or we've, we've accepted eight students into the program for next year. So now, that kind of gives you the background. You have a little understanding of what the Peace Corps Master's International Program is. And so what I'm going to do now is take you out and visit the different countries, visit the different volunteers, and let them tell you in their own words kind of what it is that they do uh, in their country as a PCMI volunteer. So those stars show where our volunteers have been uh, so far. And you can see that 
primarily were in Sub-Saharan Africa and Central South America. And we're going to start with Jake Grossman. Jake is in Paraguay. Uh, he's been there uh, almost two years. And Jake's work really is working with extension forestry. He's in Paraguay. He has never told anybody the name of his town. He has a blog, and he, tries, he calls it Pretty View. Uh, and he doesn't want people uh, in, the, in, the, in the greater world to know exactly where he is. But he does, he does blog about his experiences. In fact, he's very eloquent uh, in his blogs. And he talks about his work. Uh, he's primarily doing extension activities with farmers, and he's also doing environmental education. Part of his environmental education is trash management. Now, all volunteers have a primary job assignment, and then they're pretty much except, expected to have one or two secondary assignments. So for example, when I was a volunteer in Liberia, my primary job was teaching. My secondary, I had three or four different secondary jobs that we did kind of on the side. His is trash management. And he has, of all the volunteers that I track um, through the program, he had the most interesting summary of what he does with this particular uh, project. And he talks about, I carry around all this trash, and it sometimes makes me look a little eccentric. I usually don't know whether it's better to explain why I'm stuffing things in my pockets or to quit without further incriminating myself. And you can see him sitting on the front porch of his house with students from his class. And what they're doing is they've gone around town and collected old beer bottles and other types of bottles. They cut the tops off those bottles. They sand the rim, and they, and they reuse those as drinking glasses. So that's one of his secondary projects. Now we're going to cross the uh, Atlantic Ocean and head over to Senegal. And we're going to visit Peter Gill. He also is an agroforestry extension volunteer. And he has a little bit uh, different job that he's working on. His job is putting in place thorny live uh, fencing projects. So what he's doing is working with farmers to surround their farm plot with these live thorny bushes that will keep the livestock from encroaching onto the farms. Once he's able to do that, and they can exclude those, those animals from the farms, then those farmers can move from providing low-value crops, things like um, peanuts and millet, to more high-value crops, things like vegetables, um, uh, fruit trees, and cassava. And so doing that allows those uh, farmers to raise the revenue and to provide a better living for their families. Now we're going to move uh, over to East Africa. We're going to visit Seth Kammer. Seth is over in Ethiopia. Seth is in a beautiful place. I mean, the pictures that he sends back through his blog are fantastic. And it's just a gorgeous place to be. Here Seth is with, with one of the road crews that he's working on a forestry project. And the problems that he's dealing with are mainly centered around erosion. And so to help counter erosion, he's working on contour line planting and getting that technology adopted by farmers. And he's also working to replace eucalyptus, which tends to reduce the water holding capacity of the soil with other types of species that are fast growing and can still provide the, the, the products and the raw materials that eucalyptus did, but having less of an impact on the soil. You're going to see a picture of, of one of the sites that, that Seth works at later on, and you'll see why sometimes being in the Peace Corps is just a fantastic experience. We're going to move south into Tanzania now. Um, we've got Eric Peterson. Eric already finished the program. He's now working with the EPA. Uh, when Eric came out of the, the, uh, the Peace Corps, when he started looking for a job, he had, he had four job offers um, without really even trying. So these guys are really highly qualified when they come out of the program. Uh, Eric was an environmental volunteer, and what he did was try and work with putting together groups. And then once he has these groups uh, put together, working with them to implement incremental change. And another thing that he did was he tried to work with small business people and give them business skills. So they already had the businesses up and running, but he worked with them to develop strategic plans, marketing strategies, to try and make them more profitable. So the folks he worked with, vegetable growers and nursery tree, ma or tree nursery managers, um, he tried to make, help them develop business plans that made them more profitable. Now we're going to switch back over to, to South uh, and, or Central West Africa and to Cameroon. We've got a couple of volunteers over in Cameroon. Um, this is Brian Bragg. Brian had a, a great time while he was over um, in Cameroon. He was an agroforestry extension volunteer. And, and unfortunately for Brian, he ended up in a place where everything he tried to do was, was framed by the conflict that was in that community. There was conflict between different tribal groups. There was conflicts between small towns and large towns. There was conflicts between rural areas and urban areas. And so he ended up spending almost his entire time 
uh, in his community in Bambui, um, trying to resolve conflict. And what came out of his whole project was teaching the people in his communities how to deal with conflict, so conflict resolu resolution skills. And then our final volunteer is, is unique in a new way. Uh, Grover Yip uh, was also over in Cameroon. Grover came into our, our program right out of the PhD program at Michigan. He had just finished doing a PhD in chemistry, and he decided he didn't want to be a chemist. He wanted to be, do something with soil chemistry. He still wanted to be in the area of chemistry, but he wanted to do something with forests, and soil chemistry was a good fit for him. So he ended up going, uh, going over to Cameroon as well, um, and he started teaching people about alley cropping and how to plant trees in such a way that you can intersperse tree, crops between trees, and then as those trees grow, the leaves and the branches they drop off form an organic compost, and that reduces uh, the use of uh, expensive fertilizers that farmers needed to use. Uh, this is just a picture of, of kind of the, the alley cropping that he did there. This was taken just before he left. Those, those seedlings were planted um, and been in the ground maybe, I think, three months, and they had gone from being only a couple inches tall to about 18 inches tall. So things grow pretty quick uh, in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So those are all of the volunteers we've had in the programs. We've kind of had a whirlwind view of where they are and what they're doing. The two volunteers on the far right under the heading New Volunteers are our two volunteers who are getting ready to go out. Uh, Cynthia Harbison on top has not been placed yet. She knows she's going to be somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa, but she doesn't know where yet. And so she's, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from her almost every other day, have we heard anything, have we heard anything? And she still hasn't been placed yet. Johnny Bruce has been placed in Paraguay, and he'll be going over, um, I think he's going to overlap with Jake uh, by about three months. Uh, they probably won't be in the same community, but they'll be in the same country. So I'd like to kind of finish up with some closing observations, and we'll start with some challenges that are confronting all PCMI programs across the country. A couple of those challenges, one is recruiting. It's really, really tough to bring students, good qualified students, into the program um, particularly if they're from out of state. We have a hard time bringing, finding good qualified students in state to bring into the program. So when we try and bring them in from out of state, we're confronted with, with high tuition costs, something like three times what your in-state tuition is. And so, for example, this year, we admitted eight students into the program. We only brought two in, both of whom happened to be in state, and six declined. And when we talked to them, all of them indicated that it was a high cost of tuition. And so what we need to do is try and find ways that we can get these students uh, in-state uh, in tuition waivers or out-of-state tuition waivers so they can pay in-state tuition um, in recognition of the fact that they're going to be off somewhere for 27 months earning uh, about $180 a month. Um, and they, they won't be able to pay those, those fees. Um, the second thing is, is that PCMI program leaders are generally undercompensated, which limits the amount of time that they can put into program development, re recruiting, and student mentoring. And this fall, we did a survey of PCMI leaders across the country, and we found out that on average, um, they're spending about 14% of their time managing the program, recruiting students, answering, um, answering questions either on the phone or through the email, helping return students to put together their final papers, um, and yet their, their salary is only compensated at, at about 4%. So, so again, we see... A lot of these um, program leaders are return volunteers, and so they continue their volunteering um, contributions. And so the outlook for the, the SFR program, um, we have a lot of inquiries into the program in forestry from students who decide or who indicate they really don't want to be a forester, but they want to do the PCMI program. And it became apparent pretty quickly that, that we had a lot of students who had this desire. And so we worked with Peace Corps to develop a second program. Uh, in addition to our forestry program, and we just got approval for that program last year, that's a natural resource management program which allows students to come into forestry and to um, take any of the other disciplines that we teach within the School of Forest Resources. So they can do soil science, they can do um, urban ecology, they can do anything. Um, and as a result of that, this first year when we started recruiting into the PCMI program, our applications into the program doubled. Uh, we also took the lead in the School of Forest Resources to put together a, a joint PCMI seminar, PCMI seminar for students across all of the programs uh, here at the University of Washington. So in the University of Washington, we're blessed. We have three PCMI programs. We have the forestry program. We have one in public affairs. We have one in public health. And we thought it would be a good idea for at least for one class during that year when students are in residence 
to be together so that we could prepare them better for their experience in Peace Corps and for them to kind of form a cohort and, and, and develop a peer group that they could be together here on campus and then as they go off to their assignments still be able to be in contact with each other and provide support for each other. So we offered that, that class for the first time across all three programs uh, last quarter. And then, um, of course, the goal of, of all of these programs here at the University of Washington is to try and make sure that the University of Washington uh, maintains its status as the number one PCMI program in the country, providing both highly qualified and well-trained students into the program. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Ivan. Next speaker in this session is Susan Bolton, who is a professor of uh, hydrology in the School of Forest Resources and has adjunct appointments in the Departments of Global Health and Civil and Environmental Engineering. She's a PhD in ecology and engineering and is a registered professional engineer. And most of her research has dealt with land use effects on surface water quality and quantity, as well as the effects on riparian and aquatic ecosystems. And she's very active in Engineers Without Borders and works on projects dealing with international sustainable development in Costa Rica and Bolivia. And she's going to tell us about her Latin American experience, of food, forest, and fuel, improved cook stove projects in Latin America. Susan. Good afternoon. Uh, this, I couldn't, have, couldn't, couldn't avoid the alliteration. I'm not really going to talk about food too much, but you do cook food on stove. So this 3F sounded more fun than just forest and fuel. So. Just if you're waiting for it, recipes, don't. I gave a talk very similar to this uh, a few weeks ago. And I started the talk basically was sort of asking the students in the audience, what do you think of when you think of air pollution? And I was told this isn't really an interactive audience, so I'm just going to let you think a minute and then tell you what that group thought. And you may or may not think, have thought of the same things. But this was a group of students. And typically what they came up when I, when I asked these sorts of things is, well, they think of cars, transportation, industry, coal plants, power plants, and a few of them, if they've been through the School of Forest Resources, might even think of forest fires. So it's typically what we in America tend to think of as air pollution. We, see, we look out the window and go, yeah, it's smoggy today. Well, there's another kind of air pollution, which is quite prevalent in the world, and that is indoor air pollution. I don't mean indoor air pollution from the formaldehyde in your carpets or the cleaners that you use in your bathroom, but from cooking your food on open fire inside your house. And almost half the world's population cook daily with some sort of solid fuel. That fuel may be wood, it may be dung, it may be coal or charcoal, but it's a biomass fuel that is solid. And so we talk about um, solid fuel. Almost 2 million tons of this is burned daily um, for people to meet their daily food needs. These estimates on global energy use vary. The most recent one that I saw was 10 to 15 percent of total global energy use. Some estimates are a little bit lower than that. Some are in that range. And there's a major health component associated with this, with one to two million deaths conservatively estimated to be due to indoor air pollution, largely through reduced lung function. And I had a first aid class not too long ago where I had to, maybe not so gently, but when I tried to tell the, the, the first aid instructor that no, diarrhea was not the leading cause of death in children under five worldwide anymore. It's actually pneumonia. And that risk of dying from pneumonia is doubled if those children are also exposed to indoor cook stove smoke. And so those are some of the things that arise. We'll talk a little bit more about this as we move on. Where does this happen? So if you look at the, at the map here of the world, as you might expect, most of this the areas with the darker colors are areas where the darker the color, the more fuel wood is used for cooking. And as you might expect, most of this is in what we now refer to as the global south. Most prevalent, obviously, in sub-Saharan Africa, also very common in Asia and parts of, of Central and, Latin and South America and the Caribbean, and to some extent also Mexico. And if you've never walked into a house where someone has been cooking over an open fire for their entire lives, maybe 60 or 70 years, it's quite an amazing experience. It is, it is really hard to imagine, unless you've maybe been a firefighter on the front lines. It is astoundingly difficult to be in there. Your eyes burn, it's hard to breathe. Anything you touch, soot falls off. So it's, it's a real 
eye-opener if you've never been in it. And a lot of wood is used for this. These are data from the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO. It's a UN branch for the state of the world's forests in 2011. So this is a percent of round wood that is harvested by continent, more or less, that is used for fuel wood. And as you can see, in for, for Africa and for Asia, 90% of the round wood that is harvested is used for fuel wood. In Asia, whoops, where's my little mouse? In Asia, it's about 65%, 50% in South America, whereas in North America, it's, it's a very small percentage of wood that's actually used for that. So there's a lot of wood that is harvested that is actually used for people to cook their daily meals on. And many of the speakers before me talked about trying to put this in context about why this is even an issue, especially for us in the state of Washington or, or in the United States. So here's a chart that I've modified a little bit, but basically it has three levels of scale. So you have the household scale. And in the ordinary household, there are health issues. That relates back to the smoke and the sort of diseases that come from breathing smoke for the effects on your blood pressure, on your lung function, and even on your eye health. Safety, children falling into fires is a major cause of burns and problems in many of these households. And just general hygiene, the houses are dirty, they're smoky, they're soot everywhere. As we move up from a individual household into a community or a larger group of people, there are issues in local harvesting, personal safety, there are reports in some countries as firewood becomes farther away and if it is women who are required to forage, to forage or to go out and collect the firewood, they may be at health of being attacked, risk of being attacked or assaulted while they're getting firewood. That's not true in all countries by any means, but it does happen. It especially happens around refugee camps. There is time and effort involved, the time spent getting fuel wood rather than going to school, rather than caring for your crops, rather than doing handcrafts that you can sell or something like that. And there are issues of landscape degradation through deforestation. And then at a global level, so things that might actually affect people that live in the global north, we are learning that some of these issues have particulate matter emissions that have very real effects on climate change as the studies have begun to show. So I'll talk about each of these things as we move along. So our concern over cook stoves as a, as a population up here or as, as scientists or people or humanitarians started with deforestation. We worried that forests were being cut down to provide fuel wood. We wanted to find a way to stop that from happening. We wanted to improve the efficiency of stoves so they would use less wood. Turns out, despite the numbers that I show you about how much wood is actually used for fuel wood, that is not typically the major reason for deforestation. Conversion of forest lands to agriculture, to ranching, to cattle, to houses, to subdivisions is really a much bigger component of deforestation. So that is still, in local areas, it can be a major issue, but on a global scale, it's certainly not the main driver. Then we became more concerned about the health, especially on women and children. They are the population that are subjected to the smoke. They spend anywhere from one to three or four hours a day in that smoke environment. Children, because they're strapped to the back of their mother. And then the people began to study some of these um, emissions as they related to climate change, and we started to become aware that this was actually an issue for climate change also particularly from black carbon or what we think of sort of as soot that comes out of some of these burning of solid fuels. So what's a good stove? Um, there was a bill passed recently, the Waxman-Hartley bill, that came out of the United States Congress, which says that a good stove improves fuel efficiency by 50% and decreases black carbon by 30%. So the two things in orange are what are in the bill for, you know, this is a good stove. The other things are things that maybe ought to be considered about what is a good stove. Does it improve people's health? Does it increase the likelihood that children will not get pneumonia or will not die from pneumonia? Is it cheap? Can people afford it? And the most importantly is, and this is something that you find in the engineering community, it really doesn't matter how good your stove is. If nobody uses it, it's a crappy stove. <laughs> so you can design the most fuel efficient, the most Everything, no smoke, no nothing. But if nobody uses it, it's not worth anything. 
So the saying in the stove community is building a stove is easy. Anybody can build a stove. Building a good stove is hard. Building a cheap stove that's also a good stove is enough to make you crazy. I mean, people are still searching for how to really do this well. A brief history of this, so maybe, maybe some of you have heard, and this was widely used in the Peace Corps. The Lorena stove was developed in Guatemala. Lorena is a conglomeration of the Spanish words for mud and for sand. It did not turn out to have any efficiency gains. It was first sort of described glamorously in the literature as you know, increasing the efficiency and using less wood. It doesn't really do that, but it did get the smoke out of the house, and from a health perspective, that's very important. The disappointing thing is that these are still being built a lot in many countries, even though there's much better stove technology out there now that are both better for health and better for efficiency. It's hard to get sort of a group that latches onto something to find out that there's new things out there. The current standard is something that we call the rocket stove. And this is basically a way to increase stove efficiency. So you have a, a, heart, a grate, so the wood sits on top of a, some sort of grate. Air can come in underneath here. It can be preheated so that when it's preheated, it combusts better at the end of, the, of the, where the fire is actually burning. This is a Aprovecho. Aprovecho is a big stove testing group down in Oregon. This is one that's on the market for sale. It has the grate um, and has this sort of L-shaped design, which helps increase the efficiency of the stove. There's a very new type of stove out there called a microgasifier. Uh, they used to be called the top-lit updraft stove, but apparently the, the new term is microgasifier. And these are stoves that work on the gasification principle that are used in very large-scale things. They're being developed at the University of Washington by some research groups for forest waste. And they basically burn wood gases. They don't burn the wood. They burn the gases. They heat the wood. You put the wood in here. You light it on top. The heating front moves down. The wood gases ignite as they come off the wood as they're volatilized. And at the very end, if you turn off the air, you end up with biochar. You may have heard something about biochar being one of the other solution to, to climate change is burying biochar stores carbon for hundreds of years, and it's a way to take that out of the system. So these are also being developed. So we're going to talk about two field projects that I was involved in. One was in Bolivia with my work through Engineers Without Borders in a Quechua-speaking indigenous community and we put a rocket stove in. The other project was in Costa Rica, which I did last December with a local NGO called CCHAR with Nobe-speaking migrant coffee pickers from Panama, and these were using the microgasifier stove. So we have a service learning nonprofit chapter at University of Washington for Engineers Without Border, which is a national NGO. These are student projects in this case. They designed a rocket stove using local materials, materials, and every year since that we've gone down there, they continually modify this, largely to make the women happier with the stove, say so they will use it. So we started out with this great design. We got down there. Well, one, we didn't have the same materials that we thought we would have. Two, it didn't, you know, it was too high for the women, so we lowered it. And so every year we go back, we interview the women, and we try to make this stove better on an annual basis so that it will really meet user needs as well as meeting some of those other standards of efficiency. So we do stove testing. This is the, this is the start of the rocket box. The, here's the grate. It'll go in here. There'll be a, a, a brick put here, so that L-shaped thing will start here. And we do testing on them. We work in a villages in a semi-arid region in Bolivia. We train local men and builders how to build these stoves to help build them in the houses. We test them, and then we have a local woman who speaks both Quechua and Spanish who does the workshops and continually goes back and asks the woman if they're having problems and continually works to make those stoves work for them. So what have we done? Um, since 2005, we put in 180 stoves in eight communities. We have a waiting list of 19 communities who would like this stove project. Uh, surveys indicate that 97% of the users are highly satisfied, 95% reduction in particulate matter and carbon monoxide in the house, very significant statistics on health improvement. We're doing an epidemiology study, and good boiling times that compare comparably to their old three-stone fire. In Costa Rica, we worked with the Panamanian migrant coffee workers. This is the microgasifier stove here. 
the idea there was to start a woman's group that would make these stoves and sell them commercially. They are made out of five gallon metal buckets with holes drilled in them and a piece of corrugated tin roof around them so they're relatively easy to make out of available materials and much more portable. We put them into a, a station uh, setting so that they can't be knocked over. Here's the fire that the women, the women were cooking on earlier in the household. Their new stoves are going to go here. We did training workshops how to light the stove because it's a little bit different. You light the top of the fire instead of the bottom of the fire. We did surveys to find out how they cooked, what they cooked, what they liked about their old stove and their new stove. And we did cooking tests to see whether, how, the, whether, how the stove performed compared to the stove that they were using prior to receiving the new stove. Our outcomes there. These are first two things are lab tests. We did not do indoor air testing in the field. So the lab tests in Aprovecho showed a 91% reduction in particulate emissions, 83% reduction in CO. The CO emissions tend to be a little lower with the microgasifiers. There's not a chimney taking anything out. They're burning the smoke basically, so there is some escape of some of those gases. Our cooking test did show a 71% reduction in fuel use per gram of cooking. Cook Chicken cooked, which is a fairly substantial decrease in fuel use, 30 to 50 percent reduction in cooking time. On average, everybody got about an extra hour a day that, because the food cooked faster, and basically everybody liked the stove. So just to wrap this up a little bit, people have been doing this for decades. We're still not being very successful at it. There's a huge news push out there to do this everywhere in the world. Uh, there is a mix of both charitable models as well as commercial models to try to get people to change their cooking habits. But it's a very ingrained social thing. You can't just give somebody a new kind of stove and say, here, cook on this from now on, even though if it doesn't cook the food you like. And yet that's been how some of these projects have gone. There are known and proven benefits to health. But the real bottom line is that each community and even each household has slightly different needs and concerns and preferences. And so there is beginning to be some evidence of these huge projects. I'm starting to work with a project perhaps in Kenya on, with a commercial group that wants to sell 80,000 stoves um, by the end of the year. Um, who buys those will be interesting. Well, how long they last and who uses them will also be interesting. And as there's so many of the things with technology, really better social science inputs. What are people's real needs? What do they like or don't like? How are you sort of really looking at what they cook? What they want to cook, do they even want the wood? What, you know, are they worried about the cost of the wood? Are they worried about time spent preparing the wood? Things like that to really understand how to get a better stove into a house. And that is all, thank you. So the last speech, uh, speaker in this session is Christina Vogt, who's a professor in the School of Forest Resources and she holds a BS from the University of Texas and an MS and a PhD from New Mexico State University, all in biology. And her research interests are forest systems and bioenergy, forest sustainability, and linking social and natural science. And the title of her talk is Sustainability Unpacked. Well, I'm glad to be here because I'm going to move everybody's discussion to a slightly higher level. Uh, because I'm going to be really looking at a country level. And what I want to do is I want to really start showing you that the decisions that we make in the industrialized world, in fact, have a huge influence on what's happening in the less industrialized world. And if we don't recognize that, and if we don't try to impose our myths and values of what we think is happening there, we're going to have a lot of disasters. And so what I want to do is that we, in fact, there were uh, quite a few, so you can see the names here. Uh, we wrote a book. Uh, last year, it was published by EarthScan in uh, November. And in the book, what we did is we took 34 countries. We took countries that had a lot of forest. We took countries that didn't have a lot of forest. We took countries that had used fossil fuels, uh, had different economic development status. And the whole idea behind this was we wanted to understand what are the decisions that people make in their landscapes and how does it really impact the choices that we make? Are we really making environmental choices? In fact, two of the authors, by the way, are over there. We've got Asep Suntana from Indonesia, and then we have Maura Shelton, who's from Oklahoma. <laughs> Not very far. So anyway, when we did this analysis on forest materials, one of the things that really came out immediately is that when you use forest materials 
to, uh, for energy, in most cases, the result that comes out is that you're not very sustainable, you're not very environmental, you also do not have a very high human development index. And that's a uh, United Nations index that looks at health, education, and GDP. So if you looked at this, you would sort of say, well, forget about forests, don't even use forests, don't go do something else. The other thing that came out also that was really interesting is that most of the very uh, industrialized countries, in fact, don't use a lot of forest materials to produce energy. And what's interesting about that, if you also look at the environmental rankings of these countries, they also rank very high. So it's kind of interesting. So that again, there's that message, don't use forests because you're not going to be sustainable. And at the end of this talk, I hope that you will have a very different view. Um, the other thing that's happening is that we're, in fact, having the industrialized countries are expecting the less industrialized countries, in fact, to really mitigate for climate change. And I'll kind of show you a little data on that. So that's kind of interesting. The other thing that comes forth is that we really need to be thinking about a variety of different products from forests. We tend to focus on one thing, and that's it. And we're not going to be sustainable if, in fact, that's what we're going to be doing. So this diagram shows you uh, some of the countries. And in fact, if you look at this, most of these countries here are the industrialized countries. And if you'll notice, most of the industrialized countries, not a lot of people live in rural areas. Uh, they also spend very little of their home income on food. Most of it's on energy. On the other side here, these are most of the uh, less industrialized countries that we had in our database. And in fact, this is this line here tells you when you're spending more money on food. In fact, what you find out is that when you live in rural areas, you're still spending a tremendous amount of your income just on food. So what you have in the less industrialized countries, you do not have food security. In the industrialized countries, you don't have energy security. So it gets pretty interesting when you start looking at these things. And then the other thing that you have is that when you look at it, notice also where the US is. U.S. and all of these international databases, we never look good. We are always like 16 or 15, which is also kind of interesting. It makes you kind of wonder what the values are that go into these evaluations. But most of these countries are always ranked as being very environmental. These countries are always ranked, and in several international um, uh, indices, always very low. So that kind of tells you something too, right? So again, we get this kind of interesting link. So you got to be on this side, right? So you're going to have energy insecu uh, insecurity, and then your environmental. You don't want to be at the other end. What you also then start seeing is that if you look at the data, and we looked at countries and how much oil, in fact, they imported, and what becomes pretty obvious, except for Norway, where we know that they get their own, they drove for their own oil, most of the countries that are high human development in fact, have to import most of their oil. That tells you something, too. That's part of the insecurity. If you start looking at the countries that are at the bottom and that are ranked very low, in fact, they don't import any oil. These countries are interesting because they also drill for oil. They export most of it. And most of their people are still totally dependent on a forest. And Nigeria, in fact, has cut down most of their forests and really have no resilience in their forests. Uh, for their society. So we see these different patterns, and you don't use wood if you're in the industrialized countries for energy. And this is another diagram earlier. It doesn't have all of the countries, but the important thing is, is that this is how much biomass you use for your total energy. So this is, for instance, like over 60% here. So as this goes down, every time it pops up, that's when you have a country that has a lower human development index. So the story really looks bad. It makes its suggestion is, is that if you're, in fact, dependent on forests for your energy, you're not going to be able to develop your economies. And in fact, we have a situation where 40 to 50% of the world, in fact, does depend on wood, either as charcoal or as just burning it for their energy. The problem we have is that if you look at the FAO data, there isn't enough of it. Population increases. There's a lot of different things that have come in. 
So we've got a problem. We have to start thinking about how are we going to change the situation because this is not realistic. It's not feasible. You can't be sustainable if this is what we're looking at. The other thing that we have also is if you come back to the industrialized world model, we do not value labor in agriculture and forestry. That was very clear based on the analyses that we we're doing. And if you don't value it, you're not going to even trust what these people are doing in these particular fields. So that's kind of interesting. So the only people that really do well are the ones that are in uh, uh, more niche markets. They're producing a variety of different products. And what we did is we took these 34 countries, we took the HDI ranking, and then we had a negative relationship between, we could explain 85% of the variance in the Human Development Index ranking by uh, how many people you had that were employed in agriculture or in forestry. And it's a negative. When you go on the other side and you look at the services, if you're in the service industries, then you have a very nice, positive relationship. So the idea is, is that, well, if you're in service industries, you're going to have very high human development index. And you can also see the same thing as for the GDP. So we're seeing these kinds of patterns, and it's really interesting because decisions are made at the country level. The World Bank, a lot of organizations decide what they're going to do based on these. That's why if you get a very low environmental rank, it's bad because you don't get as much money. So you have to start worrying about it. The other thing that I think is really important to think about, if we do not think about people that live in the rural areas, we're going to have huge problems and we're not going to be able to be sustainable. It's those people that have the resources. If you can't get those resources, you're not going to be really doing well. And so what we need to do is we need to start fundamentally changing how we look at this thing. And I have Seattle, the city of Seattle here. And I've noticed that even in Washington, we have big issues between people that live in rural areas and what they're doing and how they use their resources versus what's happening in a city. And this is, and it's ridiculous. If we're really going to be sustainable, we've got to shift away from this kind of an approach or model. Now, the other angle that I want to bring up is climate change. So we're looking at carbon dioxide emissions. And one of the things that gets very interesting is when we look at this same countries again, and we look to see how much of the total carbon dioxide emitted in a year, in fact, comes from land use. Well, look at that. When we got these countries up at the top, it's almost zero. So it's not even an issue to think about what you're doing in that landscape. When you got a lot of the other emerging economy countries, you can see that, in fact, this is where it really increases significantly. And so what happens then is, is that people then saying, well, we've got to stop, like Indonesia, you know, where Asset's coming from, we've got to stop the deforestation that's occurring in those countries. And mainly it's coming from that. But if you really look at the total amount that's being emitted, it's a lot lower than what we have in a lot of these industrialized countries. And then when you look to see, and I don't know if this is clear, but I looked at the amount of carbon dioxide that in fact that's emitted each year, and this is fossil, non-fossil, and you look to say the forest area that you have, how much can you in fact absorb each year? And we know that you know, there's different ways you can look at that. The interesting thing gets back in here. Look at Congo. 100% of their carbon dioxide emissions are from land use. They could, in fact, balance more than 10 times what they emit. So what this tells me then is that what are we looking at? We're looking, in fact, at these countries, in fact, are looking to these countries to, in fact, mitigate global carbon dioxide emissions. You could say, well, is that good or not? I'm not so sure if it is good. So what I want to do now is that one of the ideas that when we're working on the book that we came up with is that if you're going to have resilient societies, you've got to make some investments. The investments have to be in energy, food, forest, and water. These are the investments that's going to help that human capital to, in fact, evolve and develop 
in to be resilient, so in face of disturbances, you're going to have a society that can, in fact, respond. We think this is really crucial. Right now, the sustainability capital is very low. We make these investments, and this is what we have. So what we're saying is we need to shift our thinking. We need to start thinking about the investments that we make in the natural resources that replenish themselves and that we're utilizing. So we need to be thinking about what we call the solar interest, not the capital. Solar capital can be coal, it can be oils, it could be a lot of different things. That's just sort of what accumulates out there. And so if, in fact, as a society, we started thinking more about the solar interest, we would fundamentally start changing. We would have almost thresholds that would tell us what we can or cannot do, and we can make better choices. This is sort of the view I see that a lot of people in industrialized countries have. I call it tunnel vision of sustainability, and we're mainly managing our solar capital. This was a cartoon that was made. Here is the industrialized society person eating at a table with a very elegant waiter bringing in all the food in very nice packets without recognizing that, in fact, where the resources come from here, in fact, they're not really doing very well. This is, this is the view I see, and I've been in a lot of different places, and when I look around, people really don't sort of accept the fact that there are issues that we need to deal with. So we think that we need to be looking at the solar interest, and we need to start figuring out how do we use that, and using it in different ways, maybe. We don't want to just repeat what the original diagrams I showed you, where it's pretty obvious that if you look at these societies, and the societies that just burn wood, they're not really doing very well. And their ability to move up with an increasing demand for limited resources, it just isn't there. So what we need to do is we need to start thinking about some different things. And this, in fact, is something that we're pursuing right now with a, uh, uh, several uh, Native American tribes in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we're interacting with some individuals uh, in Indonesia. We're looking at trying to introduce these, and we're also doing this in Iceland. And Iceland has less than 1% forest, but they're still very interested in starting to look at biomass and how can they, in fact, make something else. All we're doing here is we can use biomass efficiently with today's technology, and we can start producing products that are going to allow us to, in fact, produce energy in a much more efficient way. And I think this is where the rural environments, this is where it needs to be. In fact, I see kind of like distributed areas. And the idea behind the energy park is you're taking one product and it becomes the feedstock for the next. So you've got two or three technologies in an energy park. So you're not wasting anything. You're using all of this. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to move away from this thing where we produce one product and when society decides they don't like that product, hey, you don't have anything to go back on. So we need to fundamentally shift how we're looking at that. And right now, you can make out of biomass. Uh, there's a group we're interacting with. They make aviation fuels out of wood. <laughs> and what we're trying to do is get that, in fact, going some manufacturing. We're trying to get that on tribal lands. And this is just a brief example of an energy park. This is for producing biodiesel. And we've been interacting with quite a few people. And if you had using camelina, camelina is nice because it's very high in omega-3 acids. So it's really good for you. It's acceptable also to feed it to uh, chickens and all sorts of things. So the idea would be is you, you've got these materials coming in. It needs wood because you need methanol. That's part of biodiesel. So what you do is you've got this energy part, and then you're coming up with all these different products, plus you've got the avoided emissions of carbon dioxide. So this is what we think the future should be. So we've got a new vision for forests. It's going to be very efficiently utilizing solar interest, not solar capital. We've got to move forward. And so what I wanted to just end with this, forest materials are highly compatible for a high economically developed country. We just have to look at how we're doing it. We haven't done that. We've sort of avoided doing that. And we need to get away from the idea of saying that using forests for energy is not environmental. That is a very strong trend. You look at a lot of industrialized countries, you hear that. It's very common. We need to move away from that. And industrialized countries need to start taking care of their own carbon dioxide emissions. You know, don't expect somebody else to do it. 
You know, so we're not making those tough decisions because we sort of feel like, oh, well, we don't have to do that. Somebody else is going to take care of that. We can't afford to do that anymore. Uh, and then the big last take home message I want to tell you, solar income, that's where we got to go. Solar income or solar interest. That's what the future is. And if we, in fact, start looking at that, we can really start changing and start making sustainable choices. So I've got 24 minutes to go, and I can end on that. Okay?